we have our first scene related to engagement from our success conference actor. Okay. Today we're going to be reading a scene from As You Like It. As You Like It? As, As You Like, like it. it. I will be reading, <laughs> excuse me. I will be reading the part of Orlando. You three will be sharing the role of Oliver. King of one Oliver. line at a, excuse me, one line at a time. Teach, Let's please? just start, please. Thank you. Now, sir, what make you here? I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Now, sir, what make you here? Am I doing the next one? Yes, please. <laughs> but, um, oh, nothing. I am not taught to make anything. What ma are you then, sir? Yeah, she's a woman. <laughs> Mary, sir, I am helping you to mar that no, which God not. made a poor, unworthy brother of yours with idleness. Noel. What? Oh, nah, she can go ahead. No, it's Mar your turn, it's please. Guys. Marry, sir, be better employed. Nah, she sounds better no, than no, no, She no. got the accent and everything. It's she your could, turn. <laughs> what part? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, where we at? Yeah. Marry, yeah. sir. Marry, sir, I am helping you to mar that which God made a poor, no, unworthy brother. No, 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 brother. no, no, no. Marry, sir, be better. Oh, below that, my bad. Mary, sir, be better employed and be not a while. Whatever that means. Shall I keep your hogs and eat husks with them? <laughs> what prodigal portion have I spent that I should come to such penury? Penury? What does penury mean? You should know, know what penury she's means. She's told us by this now. so many times. Do you think, yeah. I think it means? It might. No, <laughs> she's already explained this like four phone. times. Words. I gotta check you cannot anyway. look on your phone. It's in your book. But it's Why? On the she same don't know clock. what it means, and I don't know what it means. I can't just check on Facebook real quick. I mean, Google. No, you cannot s check on Facebook or Google. Yes, Joseph. Professor, I know how to get them more interested. Maybe we should act out these scenes. No, this is not theater class. Let's continue, please. School play. Go ahead, Joseph. No. Now, where you are, sir. Oh, sir, very well, here in your orchard. Is there a problem? It's she just, turned, it says, though. so are they having a, are they having a fight? Is this? Can I mean, we just continue to read, please? <laughs> How are we supposed to read this if you keep interrupping the teacher? Well, I'm trying to understand, understand it. Why are you hating on that? She's trying to understand what they're talking about. You are okay, slandering you know Shakespeare. Who's Enough. slandering anything? Enough. Yo. Certainly engaging, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I must say that I've actually had classes like that before myself. So uh, thank you so much for exhibiting uh, one of the classes that I had just not too long ago. Okay. We have a problem in American education today, don't we? We're not engaging one another. Students are not engaging professors. Professors are really not engaging students. We're not reaching one another. Why is that? Let me read you a quote uh, by somebody, and uh, let me see if you can guess who it is. Okay. Our youth now love luxury. They have bad matters, contempt for authority. They show disrespect to their elders and love chatter in place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents. They chatter before company. They gobble up their food and they tyrannize their leaders. Who said that? Yes. Socrates, very good, yes. How long ago did he live? 2,500 years ago, right? We have, we've had trouble engaging our students and our young people for a long, long time now, not just a few years ago, but we've got some specific challenges today, don't we? What do you think those challenges might be? Anybody? You were just on it just a second ago. Oh, yeah, the cell phone, right? The iPhone, I've got one now, you know. Would you like to see my nieces? All right. Would you would you like to see the eggs that I collected uh, when I went out to Pennsylvania the other day? They're really really nice. You know, there's always something in front of our faces now, isn't it? Isn't there? There's always something there. We always tend to get what? What would you call this? Distraction. Yeah, we are driven to distraction. As a matter of fact, there was a Frontline show on PBS not too long ago called Driven to Distraction, 
um, and it had several students from big, big colleges on there. They took uh, the freshman class of MIT. We know what MIT is, you know, Big Bang Theory. A lot of people, at least Leonard, you know, the only one that doesn't have a PhD, went, no, that's not Leonard, it's Howard. Howard is the only one that, that went to MIT, and he doesn't have a PhD. But uh, they took the students from MIT, and they gave them a short lecture, and then they gave them a quiz over basic scientific knowledge, just basic scientific knowledge. Now, these are the students from MIT. They're the ones that should know stuff, right, about science. What do you think they got on the test? 78%. The average student got 78% on a basic science test, and these were freshmen from MIT, the best science minds that we have today. They also, on the same show, they took a student at Stanford who liked to, he said uh, he was texting, he was on the computer, and he was listening to a lecture at the same time. And he said, oh, I can soak this stuff up. I know what I'm doing. I go to Stanford anyway. And he's on his cell phone, and he's, he's tweeting and texting and doing all those things. What do you think he retained from the lecture that, uh, that the professor was giving? About 30% give or take, you know. That was about it, right? So we are definitely distracted. We have iPhones, we have the internet, we have texting, we have tweeting, we have earphones, right? You get on the elevator here and somebody has earphones on and the music is blasting so loud that I can hear the drums, I can hear the flutes, I can hear the guitar and all that other stuff. And it leads one to think, where, what are they going to be able to hear when they're my age? Probably nothing, you know? And then they've got tattoos all over their body, too. So I think it would be brilliant if you're a really smart person, you would open up a tattoo removal and hearing aid store in the same, <laughs> same area. I think that'd be a great idea. It's just in a few years, you know, you lose your tattoos because, trust me, you do not want Spider-Man on your forearm when you're 55 years old. You, you don't, you know, and then you won't be able to hear either. So you can go to Belltone and get hooked up and get your, your, your tattoo removed at the same time. Anyway, we are very, very distracted. You can obviously see that, right? In the classroom, uh, we're distracted. And it means that we, we, we really have basically lost the ability to listen. We've lost the ability to concentrate. We don't have a attention span anymore, do we? Not a real attention span, anything that we can really say. Um, when I tell my students about the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and that when Douglas started speaking, he spoke for an hour and a half. And then Lincoln got up and spoke for an hour and a half. And then Douglas got up and spoke for another hour, and nobody moved. Everybody listened. Everybody retained exactly everything they were supposed to hear, things like that. Um, you know, we are definitely distracted by things. The, the basic thing is, is that classic lectures don't work anymore. Classic lectures of a, of a professor standing up here and giving a basic lecture, reading their notes. I used to have a history professor. We called him the bald ego. And... Uh, he would stand up, and he had those blue books that he'd written all of his notes in, and I'm sure he did them when he was a freshman or when he was a doctoral student. And every once in a while, he would turn a page, and about half of it would, would crumple in his hand because it was all yellow and old and just kind of fall, fall to the floor. And we were supposed to listen to him, right? Well, the truth is that classic lecturing doesn't work anymore. Students can't retain that. You, can't, you cannot pick that up. Students aren't good at taking notes. They're really not good at retaining any knowledge that you present to them just by reading, right? So what does this mean? What, do you, what should you do? You guys are students. What should you do? What, what should we do to get you to retain that knowledge? Any ideas? <laughs> Teach different. Yes. I, was, I didn't pay this man, by the way. Yes. You get rid of the technology? Yeah. That's a good point. You can get rid of the technology. You certainly can. You can, get, you can really start to, uh, to engage one another, which is my whole point today. Okay, um, The classic scholar-student thing doesn't work anymore. Um, we have a perception that, as professors, that when you get to college, you're already, you're already a scholar. You're already supposed to listen to boring material, right? And if you don't get it from my notes, well, by golly, go to the library and read stuff about it, you know? But that doesn't work. That doesn't engage anybody. It doesn't get anybody done. I mean, it doesn't get anything done anymore, really. So what I would like to, to say, basically, is my idea, is that you lecture for 15 minutes. That's it. 15-minute lecture, then you quit and go on to something else. Don't go to Starbucks. You actually stay in the room. 
but you go on to something else and you have to engage students and I call them the rules of engagement. Now bear with me they're a little bit corny but I think you might understand that they get the point. You have eyes, ears, nose, yeah I know groan groan groan, throat. Okay what's that mean? That means with the eyes as a professor you engage students. You look at them. You make eye contact, right? You know them by name. You call them by name. If you're, if you're so, if you don't really understand um, how to memorize students' names, ha see, seat them in a seating chart. They'll grumble for a while, but if you can look at a seating chart and figure out who somebody is, and you call them by name, they will, uh, they will like that a lot more. You know, Dale Carnegie is the one who said that the sweetest sound to a person is the sound of their own name. And I believe that. People will really listen to you if you call them by name and ask them questions by name and are polite, okay? Um, engage the students by moving through the class. I can't move today because of the camera situation, but if you see me in class, I'm walking through the classroom asking student questions. I'll stand in the back corner sometimes, you know, that people have to turn their heads, but I'm engaging them. They're exercising their bodies and their minds at the same time. So eyes is the first one. Engage people with, their, with your eyes. Use your eyes, okay? Don't just sit down here like some professors do and read. In 1841, a long time ago, somebody, you know, and the students, what do, they, what do you do? You fall asleep in class? You do. How many people have ever fallen asleep in class? Don't lie. Yeah, a bunch of you. Okay, yeah, easy to do. So look, say names, move through the classroom. Use your eyes. Now ears. Are your students listening? How do you know if your students are really listening? What would be a good way? Ask them questions. Good. Yes, get them to write down your words in their own words. You know, actually get them to write down, what did I just say? You know, and not in a bad way. They said, you know, I, I have to get an idea of what, what it is that, I want to get an idea of what it is you think that I just said. So would you write that down for me? And would you say it back to me? That way you've got a line of communication. You're engaging somebody that way, okay? Get them to write, get them to restate your words in their own words and ask them questions. Okay, get them involved with their ears. Are they listening? How do you know? There's no real way to quantify it unless you can actually ask them the question. Thank you for your response, I appreciate that. So, ears, eyes, ears, and nose. What do your students know? Okay, what does your audience know? Uh, what do they really know about the topic? Do you think they're gonna learn just from your lecture? Remember, we're stopping lecturing after 15 minutes. So what are we going to do after the, at the next 15 minutes? And we ask questions. We get people to write stuff down. We're, we, we're trying to figure out what their ears are, are learning. But what are their brains really learning? Let's get them active. Another 15 minutes, we can have breakouts. Uh, I, saw, I heard of a history course where a professor had the students rewrite the Gettysburg Address. Say, how would you write it? What would you say today in your own words? How would you rewrite the Gettysburg Address? Right? They loved it. Absolutely. They came up with all kinds of different words and all kinds of different things. How would you have done D-Day differently? You know, uh, when they stormed the beaches at Normandy. How would you have done that? Korean War. What would you have done to the Korean War? Right? How would you have handled um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965? How would you have done that? Work on breakouts, work on exercises. Every 15 minutes, change the behavior completely. Change what you're doing, change what you're talking about. Make it an active classroom, okay? And throat, get students to stand up and vocalize. And I mean stand up and vocalize. Anybody ever go to Catholic school here? Anybody? Did you have to stand and talk? Stand and deliver, did it work for you? Yes, it did, didn't it? You remembered it, right? So at the end of class, get people to stand up and summarize for you what they learned in a good way, okay? You can't be judgmental about this, but you have to say, I'm sorry, you know, let's, let's sum up for me, recap for me, like get four or five of you, stand up and recap for me what we learned as a group today, as an engaged group. What did we do? Stand and deliver, right? But also deliver what the group learned. Not just the professor standing here being, you know, uh, you know a, a, a stentorian or a boring person, stuff like that. Just what, what did the group learn today as a group? 
right? It's, uh, it's kind of like, I, I, I hate to, equi to equate this to that, but they discovered that there was a great deal of uh, lethargy amongst uh, polar bears in Central Park. Did you, ever, did you ever hear this one? And what did they do? They were just feeding the polar bears, just throwing them dead fish. You know, the polar bears are like, yeah, yeah, okay, thanks for the fish. Something like that. They started freezing fish in the bottom of a barrel, and they got, they got the actual polar bear to go after the fish, right? And then they started, they thought, you know what, let's put live fish in the tank next to them, and that'll work, you know? They started doing that, and it engaged them. If you engage animals, trust me, you can engage students. And then we won't have to listen to what Socrates said several million years ago. We won't have teachers being tyrannized, okay? Thank you so much for listening to me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for being so engaging. I appreciate it. <laughs>